an American airman who, in March of 1944, became a prisoner of war of the German Third Reich. By the end of the war, he and some 45,000 other American and British airmen had endured the worst deprivations of their lives, the loss of their freedom, and for most, the loss of their dignity. All of us prisoners of war heard one repetitive refrain from the Germans. It was like the American equivalent to Killeroy was here. When you got caught, either the fellows who immediately caught you or the officers who subsequently interrogated you had this one beautiful thing to, to allay your fears. They would say, for you, the war is over. And that was pure BS. In my own instance, I made 15 missions. You'd think that my life was in danger 15 times. But that's far, far from it, and it's the same with every man who was a prisoner of war. Every flyer who fell into enemy hands, captivity had to be preceded by the ordeal of escaping from an aircraft that was mortally damaged, about to go out of control or explode. Fortunately, I was able to uh, manage to get through the first two passes, in which we lost uh, many of our airplanes. But on the third uh, pass, when they came through, we were hit, uh, the cockpit was hit, and uh, almost, you might say, almost exploded especially on the co-pilot side where you could look out and actually see the engines right out of the open, open air. Uh, pieces of the cockpit were flying around and we lost complete control at this time of the airplane. Four little flak bursts come up and knocked out a third engine. Well, from there on, there's no way we could hold it up, so uh, the pilot called back and he said, we're at 15,000 feet we're losing a thousand feet a minute. Pick your time and jump. In his landmark study, Aviators at Air Combat, Lieutenant Colonel Mark Wells of the United States Air Force Academy notes the following, quote, some of the worst moments were occasioned by events which took place on board an aircraft immediately after battle damage. Few other situations were as stressful nor clearly demonstrated a greater impact of chance on an airman's survival. A shell exploded right behind me and peppered my whole back with, with a, uh, a flak, shrapnel rather. And by that time, of course, the plane was pretty well on fire, so the pilot says, bail out. And so, being sitting right on top of the escape hatch, and I kept my, my chute there, my chest pack, I put it on, and how I got it on, I still don't know to this day. Pulled the escape hatch door, and out I went. In my plane, we were, the battle was going on and raging at such a pace, I didn't even know that we were hit. Uh, all of a sudden, my navigator 
gave me a yank and I turned around and he was going out the nose hatch. So I bailed out and uh, my bomb, my uh, parachute, I had a backpack on that day and uh, my parachute caught on the bomb site. So the plane by that time was in a flat spin with great centrifugal force, but I pulled myself, I chinned myself back up into the airplane, unhooked my parachute, and finally got out at about 2,500 feet. So I had barely enough time to enjoy the uh, parachute trip down when I was on the ground. They hit the ball turret with a 20 millimeter, which didn't explode. It blew my, my uh, ball turret gunner's arm off. They had to get him out of the turret and pull his chute and, and toss him out of the aircraft. I turned around and saw these fighters coming at us and I told Pax, the top turret gunner, I said, they're fighters at about 630 high. And he says, what are they? And I didn't have a chance to answer him because it already opened up on them. I emptied my guns, rather I was shooting there and noticed my inner phone my phone out of the socket. So I reached down and plugged it in. This that I plugged it in, the pilot said, bail out. Depending on the extent of damage inflicted during an attack, the occupants of a bomber aircraft might have to react within seconds to save their lives. Some airplanes exploded instantly in balls of fire when hit. Others might be flown straight and level long enough to permit their crews to bail out. There was this automatic pilot, but um, it wasn't guaranteed it was going to work. It's a very old-fashioned system. It was based on a, a, a suction-type system. We had a lever that pushed in and it controlled the controls. But if the aircraft was, aircraft was damaged, then possibly the, the system for the um, automatic pilot was damaged. There was no guarantee. Even while abandoning the airplane, men had to reckon with a multitude of things that could go wrong. Riddled fuselage structures or weakened and burning wings might collapse and send bombers hurtling earthward with terrific centrifugal force, pinning crewmen helplessly inside. In the period I was flying from June of 1941 till November of 41, bomber command was wiped out four times. So the chance of surviving and doing a tour, virtually none at all. And the it was very difficult to get out of these bombers. We had the Whitley, the Wellington, and the Hamden. The Hamden was the thing I was in. Well, to bail out of a Hamden, you had to exit from the top cockpit and throw yourself at the propellers. You never hit it, but it took courage to throw yourself at the propellers, and the slipstream would catch you, and you roll back off the wing, and you duck down underneath the tail. If you, did, if you drive straight out, you went straight out, and you'd hit the tail, and you were killed immediately with the urine tail there. So it's almost impossible to get out of these blasted planes. Nobody went out by, by the book and saying, you know, OK, chap, jump out, you know, and uh, one, two, three, and pull the ripcord and bail out. Everyone I spoke to in prison camp, they all had a more hair-raising story than another. One guy in my squadron, Charlie Chase, was from Rhodesia, and he was in Hamden, and he bailed out in his parachute pack, caught on the escape hatch as he went through, and he was hanging upside down in the plane. The plane was spinning and he was trapped upside down in the escape hatch. And finally, he was able to climb back into the plane and then crawl out and bail out again. And then he was able to bail out with his parachute and, um, and make it. Because of their bulk, parachutes were not worn directly, but required attachment before jumping. Moving even a few feet in a burning and wildly gyrating aircraft could be impossible. Hatches on some aircraft were poorly located, difficult to operate, and in at least one case, almost criminally too small for easy egress." End quote. When you take the Lancaster, the most foremost, the RAF bombers, and you think of their, the escape areas, a nice big door to get into, climb up, nice ladder, but that door when the aircraft is on fire is a vulnerable position. Not many people use that to get out. So you compare that with the fortress where you, you have your hatches and indeed the bomb bays. Okay. Well, there's no way you're going to get out of a Lancaster bomb bay. But you did have this front hatch, not much bigger than that, where five men generally, the pilot, engineer, bombardier, navigator and wireless op would 
invariably want to use that, and one of them would with a with seat parachute, the pilot, probably last man out. And perhaps some of the losses were to do with this. Who knows? We can't really say that they were, but uh, it certainly wasn't the easiest aircraft to uh, get out. Once I'm out in the air, the, there's absolutely no sensation of falling. There's no reference point is the big reason. There's no feeling of falling. Once I straightened out, I, had, I fell free because I knew that we had been at 27,000 and I, and I had anoxia pretty bad. And uh, one reason I, I could do some of the things, uh, there was absolutely no fear of bailing out. As survivors reached the ground, captivity began for most. Those who did not survive were frequently buried at the crash site. Here, a member of the 96th bomb group has been laid to rest. A German newsreel depicts initial captivity. Are you wounded? Uh, twisted ankle, twisted ankle, but that's all. You can work, I'm sorry. Yes. Airmen such as these were fortunate enough to have fallen into the hands of the Luftwaffe. Their safe arrival at an air prisoner of war camp was virtually assured. It was far different for others. The airmen prisoners were confined to four principal camps known as Stalag Lufts. Officer prisoners were taken to Stalag Luft I at Barth on the Baltic Sea and Stalag Luft III at Sagan, southeast of Berlin. Non-commissioned officers were imprisoned at Stalag Luft VI at Heidi Krug on the border of East Prussia and Lithuania and Stalag Luft IV at Kiefheide in East Prussia. Throughout the air war, there were over 6,000 downed airmen who managed to evade capture. The bulk of these bailed out over German-occupied countries, such as Holland, Belgium, France, and Yugoslavia. There are no true numbers or no uh, actual numbers as to how many airmen evaded capture during the World War II in, in Europe. Uh, however, the British have estimated that there are approximately 2,000 Americans that evaded capture and got back to England before D-Day, which was a significant milestone in that operation. In Northern Europe, the flight paths of RAF Bomber Command and the 8th Air Force were generally over Holland and Belgium. The bulk of the successful evaders parachuted into these areas. Their escape from capture was predetermined by chance. The area they landed in and their being observed by members of the resistance. In a few instances, they had to take desperate measures to avoid capture. I woke up at 4.30, I heard voices down the road, and uh, they sounded guttural, guttural. I knew they were either German or Dutch or something like that. And uh, so I, I had my 45 strapped on the outside of my uniform and I took it out and threw a shell in the chamber. And uh, the voices kept coming closer and as they came down the road there, I saw that they were two Germans. Both of them were very young. They were in the Luftwaffe. And uh, as they came uh, closer to me, why I got deeper and deeper and tried to hide myself as much as I could, but finally, the taller of the two saw me, and he had a Schmeiser machine gun, and he uh, pointed it at me, and at that time, I got up, and I started shooting, and I shot both of them. And uh, I, uh, they, they, they were both killed, and that was, that was a bad moment in my life. For many evaders, their odyssey came to a heartbreaking end after months of successfully evading capture. In most cases, their lack of bilingual skills gave them away. Such was the fate of this downed air crew from the 493rd Bomb Group, seen here in Belgium in their civilian disguises with their Belgian protector. The Dutch and Belgian resistance had developed escape networks. These resistance groups paid dearly. One of the things that few people realize is the high risk that occurs. And we now know that for every one of us that the people of Holland got successfully out of the country and back to our units, that they paid with three lives. Uh, in Belgium, 
uh, the uh, resistance people paid with two lives for every one of us that came back. And in France, it was one on one. Another hazard that evading airmen had to deal with were collaborators or informers who would turn them in for bounty. In the summer of 1944, the Gestapo had managed to penetrate parts of the French resistance in Paris with a collaborator who betrayed 181 Allied airmen. These men were fated to become known as the Buchenwald Airmen. The Gestapo ignored their prisoner of war status and placed them in boxcars along with their French protectors and shipped them to the infamous Buchenwald concentration camp. One of the very unfortunate situations that happened, of course, was late a group of the men who were evading were captured, by, taken by the Germans, and sent to Buchenwald. Their presence at Buchenwald became known to the Luftwaffe, who secured their transfer to Stalag Luft III. This transfer took place just a week prior to their scheduled execution. They arrived at Stalag Luft III, in a pitiful state. When the Red Cross finally got them out of there, they, they came to the camp and they were more like skeletons. They, they were staggering around, they were absolutely gaunt, no flesh on their bones at all. And their, their, their skulls were just like, you know, they're just eyes staring there. And we realized how bad it would be if we went into a concentration camp. <clears throat> and uh, they told us the stories of how people were being executed there in the camps massive executions of thousands of people at a time, either by shooting or flamethrowers and things like that. So we knew that there was no horsing around. We knew that if the SS intended to kill us, then we knew where we were going. For the evading airmen who managed to slip through Paris, it was then south to Toulouse, and then the perilous climb over the Pyrenees Mountains to neutral Spain. We spent <clears throat> three days and three nights in the Pyrenees Mountains. And uh, uh, that was a very trying time because it was very taxing. And uh, there were, the guide had four of us. The most difficult was uh, the, uh, the second night in which we were getting pretty high into the Pyrenees Mountains. And we were walking in the clouds. There was a light rain falling. And it was absolute total darkness. Finally, he led us to a point uh, that he let us know we were going to cross a swinging bridge. This swinging bridge didn't feel too comfortable. and had ropes on the side to hang on to, I since learned that it's probably a good thing I crossed it in total darkness. Because the bridge over the gorge was 300 feet long and nearly 600 feet above the water in the stream below. We started into our final climb in the mountains. And this again was darkness, but later the the moon came out. It was clear we'd gotten above the clouds. And we were at first, we were walking in snow that was about knee deep. And finally, as we began to approach the very top of the mountain, which divided Spain and France, uh, we were into snow waist deep. Other of 80s were picked up by British torpedo boats off the Brittany coast. All we could hear was a lot of gobbledygook in French that most of us didn't understand. But when they heard the magic words, they said, come on, allons-y, we go. And they said that uh, the message that they heard from the BBC was good evening to everyone at the House of Alphonse. In French, bonjour et tout le monde de la maison d'Alphonse. And they knew when they heard that message that a British gunboat had left the shores of the Dartmouth, England, and was headed for the Plua area and to pick up Allied airmen and to bring agents in. So we took off and we walked out two kilometers to the coast, climbed down a very steep cliff, and we waited on the beach for the uh, 
the British gunboat that we expected to come. But after another hour, a little plywood, uh, or little uh, rowboats came in. There were five of them. We climbed aboard, and the British sailors rowed us out to this MGB 503, which took off and under full diesel power and headed out for England. And about seven hours later, we arrived in Dartmouth, England, away from all of the occupied countries, free men again. Some airmen were hidden in areas where underground transportation was either too hazardous or too unavailable. Many of these men opted to assist the local resistance. Such men as Claude Murray and Harry Dolph aided the Dutch while others like David O'Boyle aided the Belgians. Had they been captured as members of the resistance, they would have been executed. The type of chap who evaded, I always found there was something rather special about him. He was, uh, how can I put it? I don't think as a prisoner of war that I would have uh, been front of the queue to escape. As the bomber offensive grew, so did the outrages against captured airmen. While Germany officially acknowledged the Geneva Convention, they circumvented it with inflammatory speeches and newspaper editorials. Paul Josef Goebbels, Hitler's propaganda minister, published a front page editorial on May 27, 1944, charging that Anglo-American attacks over Germany were no longer warfare but murder, pure and simple. He went on to say, it seems to us hardly possible and tolerable to use German police and soldiers against the German people when it treats murderers of children as they deserve. Fighter and bomber pilots who are shot down are not to be protected against the fury of the people. I expect from all police officers that they will refuse to lend their protection to these gangster types. Authorities acting in contradiction to the popular sentiment will have to account to me." End quote. The actual number of murdered airmen is impossible to gauge. It was a significant number. Only God knows, but there were a lot of them. There's no way you would ever, the people who did it, who killed him with a pitchfork in the field and buried him on the spot, they'll never tell. But we had some real uh, atrocities during the, uh, the, the Germans' desperate uh, attempt in, in the West on New Year's Day, uh, the Ardennes. Um, some of the fighter pilots who were working um, close support. I remember one group commander, a colonel, was shot down, captured, and the SS troops spread-eagled him on the front of their tank. When I bailed out, I landed up in the hills. My pilot, who must have bailed out the top hatch, and my guess is hit his legs against the rudders of the B-24, landed down in the valley, and was uh, not able to get up and run. While I watched, some farmers came by and pitchforked him to death. And that night I went down and I got his dog tags, and the next day when some of the Germans came by, they said, well, this is what the American bombers deserve. In this German news photograph that was published in a Portuguese newspaper is a captured 8th Air Force bomber crew. According to the caption, they had just safely crash landed their aircraft by the North Sea. They were from the 92nd Bombardment Group. Four of the crew were positively identified by their families. They were Staff Sergeant Wendell Phillips, First Lieutenant Walter Lansford, Technical Sergeant John Lindar, and First Lieutenant Frank Pearson. None have ever been seen again, and to this day, their remains have never been found, nor have those responsible ever been brought to justice. According to the missing air crew reports, uh, our pilot was found about 500 meters from the plane. Uh, in my opinion, that is not true. I believe that he was shot from the ground 
because he was, he had opened the chute and he came down. And since they were shooting at me, I, I reasoned that they did shoot him. This covert photograph, which was smuggled out of Mathausen concentration camp, documents a horrifying and sadistic deed in progress. The group of prisoners carrying packs of rocks on their backs up the slope included American, British, and Dutch airmen. They were forced to carry the packs continuously until they dropped and either died of exhaustion or, if they were not dead yet, they were shot in the head. They were all dead within 24 hours. When they unloaded this off the train at Frankfurt, the RAF was just leaving. And I saw the German civilians capturing English flyers, wiring their hands and back of them and throwing them into burning buildings. So I, they did not like anybody. As we marched through the town, <clears throat> we realized that the German guards were our best buddies, at least for today because the German civilians were attacking us with anything, pitchforks, uh, rakes, rocks. Uh, and as we walked through the town, which was in smithereens, and, and you could look and see toilets hanging and plumbing hanging off the side, um, sirens still wailing, um, and uh, just complete chaos. Um, for a moment you, you realize that uh, these people really didn't like you and probably for good reason because you were part and parcel of, uh, of the Allied team that had, uh, that had done this. Before we left the, uh, the carnage that was our prison camp in the Palm Gardens, uh, as we were marching out we did see uh, three RAF bodies hanging from telephone lines where evidently they had been lynched, um, you know, by German civilians. In war, the element of chance plays a pivotal role in everything. It was particularly dominant in the air war, and in turn played a key role amongst airmen prisoners. At Stalag Luft III, chance brought together a group of American and British Commonwealth captives whose collective skills and determination led to one of the most spectacular events of the Second World War. It came to be known as the Great Escape, and for 50 brave RAF airmen, it was to be an unmitigated tragedy. Two of the key players in this drama were squadron leader Roger Bushel and Lieutenant Colonel Albert P. Clark, known to his peers as Bub Clark. Clark was one of the very first Americans to be shot down and was the first American officer at Stalag Luft III. He was to be behind the wire for 33 months. His British comrades liked him from the start. Lieutenant Colonel, when he came to uh, Stalag Luft III, young man, very impressive, because obviously a professional soldier, West Pointer, and uh, I knew him only peripherally as a Brit, because uh, he, was in, he was the guy in charge of the Americans then. And uh, so I knew him, but I didn't know him well. I've met him since, since I've been in this country with the prisoner uh, group. Um, but he was a uh, big S, big security in the camp, and which meant that he was in charge of all security. Uh, and the little S in every block was, was uh, re responsible to him. But it meant that the security in the camp was absolutely fantastic. In the years to come, Colonel Clark was destined to become the superintendent of the United States Air Force Academy and retired from the Air Force as a lieutenant general. Clark and Roger Bushel became close associates and the best of friends, a friendship that was destined to be cut tragically short some two years later when Bushel was brutally murdered by the Gestapo. Roger was a lawyer by profession and an auxiliary uh, in the RAF. In other words, he was reserve forces is what we would call them. But he was uh, a squadron leader in fighters and was shot down over the evacuation of Dunkirk. He was a brilliant man and he was obsessed with escape. He had escaped twice before. Um, and the last time he escaped was from Barth. And he got 
to Prague and got into the hands of the Prague Underground. And he stayed there a year. They couldn't get him out of town for some reason with the, with the uh, Czech family. And when the Czechs assassinated uh, Heydrich, the uh, German high commissioner, the Germans, of course, swept through Prague with a fine-tooth comb. And uh, he, he and his family were caught. The family, of course, was executed. He was taken to Berlin by the Gestapo. And he was there for some months. And I was in Stalaglyph III when he finally returned to camp. He looked like he'd been beat up a bit. He had an eye that had been damaged. And my guess is that the Gestapo had warned him that if he ever escaped again and was caught, it would be the end of Roger Bushel. I think in, with full knowledge of this, he continued his escape activities. As a matter of fact, he became the, in, at Stalingrad III, he became the senior man in charge of escape activity. Before anything could begin, the collective skills of the swelling American arrivals, along with the more prison-wise British, had to be organized. We interviewed them first to find, to be sure they were legitimate uh, prisoners of war and not uh, scabs that the Germans were trying to send in to learn our, our activities. Uh, so we, we also interviewed them to find out what their skills and their background was as far as things that might help us. We found people who were excellent photographers who could uh, do um, beautiful printing work so that they, we put them in the forging department to forge uh, gate passes and travel papers and things of that sort. Some of them uh, developed immense skill, good enough to pass the Gestapo checks if you know what I mean. Others uh, knew how to make maps, compasses, clothing, civilian clothes. We had people who had great skill at making a wooden gun that looked exactly like, like the guards were carrying. Uh, we had people who could blow glass, who knew metallurgy and could take a rough piece of strap iron and make uh, a cutting tool that would cut wire in the, in the, uh, in the barbed wire. So uh, we were very careful to find out what the skills were, and <clears throat> we never failed to find someone who could do the things that needed to be done. Roger Bushell became the big X for planning the escape, and Colonel Clark became the big S for maintaining its security. The tunnel was nearly two years in preparation. The man in charge of digging the tunnel was a Canadian mining engineer named Wally Floody. Well, Wally Floody, you didn't see much of him because he was underground most of the time. And uh, he looked like death warmed up. He was so haggard. And um, he was a mining engineer from Canada. And uh, he refused to go in those tunnels. They were so, he realized how dangerous they were. So once he became there as a mining engineer, he, he insisted that the, the tunnels had to be shored for every inch of the way. Nothing at all. Everything was boarded up with bedboards, as you know. They were, we lost all our bedboards that way. And uh, we, uh, uh, but Wally Floody was more responsible for digging the tunnel in the Great Escape, the so-called Great Escape by Hollywood, anyway, that uh, um, Wally Floody was more involved in it than anybody else. He'd buried a couple of times, I guess it buried for some time. They had to pull him out of there. I was very lucky to survive. When they opened uh, Stalaglyph Three in April of 1942, it was in a pine forest, and initially the, we tunneled shallow, and we lost every one of them. So we went deep. We went down to 30 feet. We never hit anything except pure sand. So we had to shore all the way. It was extremely dangerous. And so the tunnels were that deep, and the, the, all of the three famous tunnels that that uh, confused the Germans in that north camp where the successful tunnel was broken. All were deep. And uh, people have asked, where'd you get the materials to shore them? Well, when they opened that camp, the Germans made a very bad mistake. They put uh, complete sets of bedboards in every bunk. 
And by the time that tunnel was finished, people were strapped, tying wire and rags in there and rope to sleep on because all their bedboards were down in the tunnels. Wally Floody, shown here with three fellow Canadians, typified the international labor of the RAF. We had people from all over the British Commonwealth. We also had Poles and Frenchmen and Czechoslovaks and all sorts of people there too. We had a great mix. Anybody in the Royal Air Force was in that camp with us. And uh, a very, very international group of people, really. And the, the British, in their usual um, consistency for class distinction, if you were an officer, you had to be a gentleman. A gentleman had to have a profession. <clears throat> so virtually all the RAF people were professional people. I was an architect. There were lawyers. There were doctors. There were painters. There were journalists. There were all sorts of people there. Every you think of a you think of a profession, and we had, we were represented there. And to put all that talent together in one place was just the most foolish thing the Germans ever did. One of the more unique jobs parceled out by Colonel Clark was being assigned to be a talker. Talkers had to have strong language skills. They were to seek out the German guards and see who could be bribed. Here, two RAF talkers are engaging in a seemingly friendly conversation with two German NCOs. They are, in fact, setting up a bribe. There was a lot of opportunities to get one of them aside and with a little barter, chocolate, cigarettes, soap, were all priceless in wartime Germany. Now, they had no soap that, that you could call soap. Uh, they, had, it, they didn't have anything except horrible cigarettes that weren't even made out of tobacco. And chocolate, of course, was unknown in Germany during the war. <clears throat> so with those three barter items, we could always find a few Germans who were willing to take a risk and give us the information or the items that we needed like batteries for radios, maybe a tube for a radio set. We could make, we had guys in the camp who were so skilled they could make a radio, the only thing they couldn't make was the tube. Anything else they could make. So we always had radios. Another senior officer arriving at Stalag Luft III was Colonel Delmar Spivey, who was destined to be the ranking American officer in one of the five compounds. In time, he was to show his medal to the Germans. Delmar Spivey was a senior officer in the, in the uh, North Camp of the Americans. He, he was quite a man, and he, he really had things organized very well for well, security and everything else. And I know one of the stories that came out of there is the fact that the Germans came in there, and they demanded a list of all the Jewish people that were in the camp. They wanted him to turn it over to them. Well, you can guess the reason they were wanted that. And, and Delmar says, we don't have any Jewish people in here. We're all Americans. A constant threat to those engaging in covert activities were a group of specially trained guards known as ferrets who roamed the camp's interior. The Kriegies had to have watchers on duty at all times, since the ferrets' locations anywhere in the compound had to be constantly monitored the security of the tunnel was always on the line. My job was to protect the security of the, of the uh, tunnels. In fact, to, to protect the security of all the clandestine work that was going on. We had a dozen factories at work, making clothing, making false passports, making maps, compasses, tools, and handling money and intelligence. We had to get information into the camp by discreet interrogation of the Germans who were constantly coming into the camp. Major John Dodge was the only American to participate in the Great Escape. He was already an incorrigible escaper. A veteran of the First World War, he joined the British forces in 1939. His fellow prisoners nicknamed him the Dodger. Here, Dodge is shown being escorted at gunpoint back to the train from which he had just jumped. The Dodger uh, was in the camp, and I think, I think he was more responsible for us being saved unwittingly than he realized, because he had stuffed his clothes with so much stuff in the escape that he, he couldn't get through the tunnel very clearly, and was pulling all the, the boards down, and they had to pull him back and unload him, and uh, 
put him back on the train again, that a lot of time was lost. So only 76 people escaped from the tunnel. They, were, they did intend to have 250 people escape. And Hitler was so angry uh, at Berchtesgaden when the 76 escaped, there's no question that 250 had escaped, he'd have gone berserk. The moment for the escape finally arrived on the night of March 24, 1944. Roger Bushel had selected 250 to go through the tunnel. He put those men who spoke fluent German at the head of the line since they'd have the best chance. The three who managed to successfully escape were fluently bilingual. The escape was discovered after 76 had gotten through the tunnel. Even so, it had an electric effect. What followed, however, was shocking. After this escape, Hitler said, that's it, shoot them. We've got to stop this nonsense. By the time the, the rule, the, the, the order was down to the implementation stage, it became shoot more than half. And that's how the magic number of 50 showed up. Only three people got back, as you know, from the Great Escape. One Dutch from Van der Stock and the two Norwegians who all looked like Germans. They spoke German fluently and they knew Europe like the palm of their hands. It was like being in their own back garden. They spoke German so fluently that, uh, uh, that they're the only people that really had a dog's chance of escaping, really. The 50 people that escaped, they, they brought them back to the, the Gestapo jail, the ones they captured, all but the three, they brought them back to uh, Gurlitz, to the Gestapo jail. They're all in prison there. And then having decided to kill 50 of them, they all were taken back to where they found, caught them originally. But they, uh, they took them all the way back there and let them get up to go to the bathroom and uh, stretch their legs and shot them in the back of the head and that was the end of it. They cremated them right on the spot. So every, they were all cremated in different villages, different places, different funeral parlors, and they all had different urns. Then they brought the 50 urns back to us and they said, this is your problem now, now you take care of it. So we designed a mausoleum for the 50 urns and put them there. When the news of the 50 murders reached Stalag Luft III, it had a numbing effect. This poster accompanied the news. Well, of course, it was a, a, a great shock. Um, we had no reason to believe that the Germans would react that way, although we were we were all aware of the fact that a Massenflug, a mass escape, was a very serious thing in wartime Germany. And it would result in various uh, serious countermeasures. More guards put on every bridge, more uh, paper checks in all the trains, uh, the border guards are being alerted, many things of that sort which detracted from the war effort. The Luftwaffe was not involved in this. They were as shocked as we were. And um, they, I think, had to uh, take a pretty stiff drink before they had to come into our camp and tell us what had happened. They looked shook. And um, naturally, we were quite shaken by the whole thing as well. The air ministry was very bloody-minded and were determined to track these guys down and uh, deal with them. And they did a marvelous job. But I think they found most of the principles. And I can't see any reason why they shouldn't have executed them. It was cold blood. As you know, I shot down on the 22nd of March uh, of 44, and the great escape took place on uh, March 24th, March 25th. When I got there, the camp was in a state of euphoria because of the great escape. They were so happy. Uh, 76 men had broken out. Uh, but within a, a few days, we learned that the Germans had murdered 50. 26 others uh, were put in the cooler, solitary. Uh, so there were only three that were successful. Uh, the colonel, as a senior American officer at that time, uh, that was, this was before the arrival of General Vanneman, 
uh, got us all together in the theater and he spoke to us and let us know, gentlemen, we are helpless and hopeless. And you can imagine what happened to the morale. I'm sure he was shook up by the death of these people and the bestiality of the Germans. Goering saved our lives because he says you can't shoot these people. Hitler wanted to shoot us all and Himmler wanted to shoot us all. He says you can't shoot these people, they're British officers. They're only doing their duty. And uh, besides, they've got German prisoners in England and America. So that we've got to be careful what we do. So Hitler decided on last round number, 50 people. The SS told us on that day, after the escape, they said, well, gentlemen, you have nothing more to worry about now because we're going to win the war and you're going to spend the rest of your lives here rebuilding the cities you destroyed. And I think they meant that. They said, and by some mischance, you should win the war. You're not going home anyway. So we knew under that point we're under sentence of death till the end of the war. As the Russian armies were advancing from the east, three of the Stalag Lufts were ultimately evacuated. Stalag Luft III's time came in the midst of the worst European winter in decades. Some of the POW camps were liberated by the Russians, but not the airmen. Adolf Hitler personally saw to that. It was perfectly obvious that when they got 30 miles or so away that the Germans were going to have to make an important decision, whether to let us be liberated by the Russians or whether to try to uh, keep us. And Hitler's personal decision was, don't let the Luft gangsters be liberated by the Russians. I want to keep them as hostages. The march began late at night in a blizzard. Within hours, the bitter cold, along with the malnourished condition of the prisoners, began to take its toll. I think that column of personnel, POWs, from the five compounds must have totaled 20,000 to 25,000 people. To move out at midnight in the dark at night, ill-prepared for cold weather, certainly ill-prepared for survival in any way from the standpoint of foods, and moving out with all your possessions. And uh, as we went through the night, why the cold weather attacked some and, and they didn't make it. Uh, can't speak the numbers or names, but they're people that were not in the column the morning following the night before. We started out in the worst blizzard they had in Germany in about 25 years. It was cold, it was snowing, it was blowing like you wouldn't believe. During the walk, once you sat down, you had to keep your feet moving, your toes, in your shoes, because if you didn't, they would freeze. And it got so bad, a lot of the guys just start throwing all their packs away. And I remember that I was one of the, probably one of the, the more fit than the other ones, and I would take packs from a number of the guys and carry them on my back so that guy could get up and start walking without his pack. We walked for three solid days before we even stopped us in the south compound. Well, they did stop sometimes right in the road and we, everybody just fell down in the snow. And you were so frozen stiff, you couldn't get frozen anymore. I lay down in the snow because I was tired. I probably would have been left there and frozen to death if Junior Couch hadn't taken a look at me and become obsessed with the fact that I was goofing off. And in whatever his condition was, he became angry and ended up kicking me good and hard until I finally suddenly came to, got up, and tried to hit him as hard as I could for kicking me, which was probably like a love pat, but he got me up and going. We wish we'd died from sometimes. We reached the end of our physical endurance. It just, you couldn't survive marching like that all the time. It's interesting, you're writing a story about it, you never realize what ice beating in the face would do all the time. But after a few days, 
Our gums were all raw and bleeding, with gasping for air as we marched, and the ice slashing in our faces there, and all the skin was ripped off our, off our gums there. Our mouths were bleeding all the time. The march ended at Spremberg, where they were put in boxcars. Another kind of horror soon began. They put us on boxcars, herded us in there like cattle, the old 148 boxcar crowded in there. Sickness, dysentery, fear, all the emotions that go with that, to proceed on to our next destination. Somewhere around Dresden, they stopped the train and let us out the stretch. And uh, it must have been an awful sight to see all those bare buttocks of thousands of prisoners relieving themselves because of the dysentery. The boxcars are called 40 and 8. It's supposed to be 40 men or 8 horses. We were about 60 men to a boxcar. The conditions were foul. Uh, if animals had been in there before us, they didn't bother to clean them out, so we were right in the manure. I guess while the uh, uh, train was taking on water for the boiler, uh, we were permitted to uh, evacuate our bowels and there'd be hundreds of Americans lined up, uh, drop your drawers and have a bowel movement. And it didn't matter if there were German women, children, civilians watching. We were treated like animals. We were treated like subhumans. As the men from Salag Luft 3 headed westward, the NCO airmen at Salag Luft 6 had already been undergoing evacuation. In their case, however, the sadism and depravity of their captors were their constant companions. In the summer of 1944, as the Russians were approaching, Heidi Krug was evacuated. The airmen were first taken to the Lithuanian port of Memel, where they were packed into the hold of a ship. It was a terrific, miserable uh, trip back. They had us, they put us down in the hole of this freighter and we were about 15 or 18 feet below the water line and there was not even room to lay down. It, you, it's just a matter of sitting up all the time. It wasn't, it was so crowded. Many a witness will tell you we went on that uh, uh, terrible uh, voyage down the Baltic Sea and to uh, uh, vessels thinking we might get torpedoed at any time and then when we finally uh, um, um, we lost a man incidentally who who sort of lost it and uh, when he was on deck he jumped overboard uh, in an attempt to swim to Sweden which was God knows how many hundreds of miles away um, from that point the Germans would not let us on deck at all so if you had to do anything uh, relieve yourself, you just did it where you were, which was down in the hold. And you always learn to count your blessings. I remember in the hold of that ship, it was unbelievable. It was in July, the heat was deplorable. They put a tarpaulin over the damn hold so that you couldn't get any air. Then they would occasionally bring the tarpaulin back, put down buckets so that you could put cigarettes in the buckets. So the buckets would go up and they would come down again with water. Hopefully they came down with water. And I remember as bad as I felt looking one, and I saw one guy that was hanging on the, on the hull, of the inverted hull of the ship there, um, with two rings, which evidently were meant to fasten cargo. He had his two arms through those rings, like a crucified Christ, and he had an abscessed tooth. And his face was up like it was, and he was in complete agony. And you know, you just felt, is stop feeling sorry for yourself. L look at him. And there was always another him. What occurred upon their arrival at Stalag Luft IV was one of the most infamous incidents of the prisoner of war experience. It is known as the Heidi Krug Run. Amongst the airmen was a young man who was a writer poet. His verse recaptures his experiences as a combat airman and as a prisoner of war. He recounts that day. When we uh, finally emerged from the, uh, the two ships, 
uh, I think it was in his port of Schweinem on the near Stettin, uh, we were taken by boxcar to a f place in the forest, uh, which was going to be our new camp. We didn't know the name of the camp at that time. However, we knew something was up because we were being shackled, uh, handcuffed. My uh, right hand, for instance, to your uh, left hand. There was a German captain in charge of these guards by the name of Pickard, a little red-headed captain, and he was mean as a snake. He had with him also a sergeant who was about six foot eight or nine inches tall, whom everybody called Big Stoop. And he was about as mean as they come also. Well, as they got us off of the train, they handcuffed us two and two. They had set up machine guns about every 50 yards all up that road on both sides. And you had to look close to see them, but they were out there. Well, as we started to march up the road, all of a sudden this German captain gives an order to run and uh, all of the guards had these uh, German shepherd dogs. So they turned the dogs loose on us and uh, we were ordered to run. When we stopped, we put the handcuffs back on because all we could hear was Rouse, Rouse, Schnell, Schnell, out, out, go. And when we got out, they formed us up in lines of four. And there were not only our regular German guards, I don't know about the Hitler Youth, but they had naval cadets there. And the naval cadets and the regular guards had bayonets on their rifles. And a lot of the uh, naval cadets had Alsatian dogs and very short leases. The prisoner poet Bob Doherty writes, Oh God, don't make me bawl. I know war's war, but this takes all. Who could ever be so vile to prod with bayonets the while and threaten any sound with fury of Alsatian hounds? The new commandant uh, that is the commandant for the march anyway that was about to happen or the run uh, was named Pritchett. He was a short, red-headed uh, uh, captain. And he was a very mean, banty rooster. Um, we were all forced to run from the train station to the forelaga of the new camp. A lot of the fellows were not physically able to make a run like that. And they would fall out. Well, of course, the man they were handcuffed to couldn't get loose from him, and they would pick him up. The ones that were falling out, the other guys would <coughs> pick him up and <coughs> carry him. Who could ever be so cruel? Kids who ought to be in school. Brats who take their sport of us as we make our exodus from one plateau of Dante's hell to this new Silesian cell. It was a time, believe me, of, of heroism that was unsung. Um, brother carried brother. Uh, man uh, would be bayoneted if he fell down. And you can imagine, if you happened to be handcuffed to a fellow who had just been shot down recently, and was still limping because of a wound in his leg, you two weren't making too much progress and you became the, the target for these people. Um, one of our men, Don Kirby, uh, was a, uh, an athlete and he uh, saved a, another prisoner by the name of Greg Hatton. Hatton probably would have died had not Kirby uh, just practically taken him on his back and, and, and helped him along the way. A lot of fellows were bayoneted, a lot of them were bitten by dogs, and some were, uh, well, rifle butts and so forth. The Germans were trying to get us to bolt, is what they were trying to do. And then they could just machine gun us down. 
But those guys, they come through, there was never a, a, even a thought of trying to bolt from the crowd. They were just typical American soldiers. These blue-eyed blondes, so clean and neat, lunge with sticks and trip our feet. There were, in the end, about 150 um, cases of dog bite, bayonet wounds, uh, broken legs, uh, you name it. So it, it, if there were no deaths, there were many crippling experiences, uh, both mental and physical. Uh, that, incidentally, that Heidi Krug run, or the run for your life, as it's known in POW law, went down as a war crimes and was subsequently uh, investigated by the United States War Crimes Commission. produced varying degrees of stress and depression. Some recalled that it would come and go. For others, it was a slow and imperceptible buildup that would overwhelm them with a feeling of hopelessness. These conditions were variously referred to as barbed wire fever, being round the bend, or being stir crazy. Sometimes the most innocent or mundane circumstances could trigger it. Early one Sunday morning, we were talking about what we would do in England, how we'd be going on a pub crawl, be going to the Red Lion, which I now own, you know, but places like that. And you fantasize about this thing of going to the pub and so on. And as we walked around, two women came out of the woods. And, they were, and the, the tangent of our circuit, like we didn't try to be near them, but as they went by, the younger woman turned to us and says, good morning, gentlemen, what a beautiful morning. We said, yes, miss, isn't it? And those few words in a woman's voice coming through to us, we hadn't spoken to a woman for so many years. We'd had completely celibate society there. But as those few words coming through to us just hit us like a laser beam right between the eyes. We didn't have to say anything to each other. We both staggered back, went back to our beds. We went into a deep depression. We were that way for weeks until we shook it off again because we realized we're in a backwater and except for our own immediate family, nobody gave a damn about who was there, just there. We were, we were just wasting away in this camp there and uh, nobody gave a damn about outside people being born, making love, being heroes, being cowards, fighting, dying, all sorts of things were happening out there and nothing was happening to us, just locked away there. And it's very, that was the most profound thing that happened to me in prison camp. When they liberated so many thousands of prisoners that they didn't have a uh, army of doctors and dentists and, and nurses. 